You're listening to Season 3 of Mobile Suit Breakdown, a podcast covering the entirety of sci-fi mega-franchise Mobile Suit Gundam for new fans, old fans, and not yet fans, where we watch, analyze, and review all 41 years of the iconic anime in the order it was made. We research its influences, examine its themes, and discuss how each piece of the Gundam canon fits within the changing context in Japan and the world from 1979 to today. This is episode 3.32, The Relentless Machine. And we are your hosts. I'm Tom, a lifelong Gundam fan, and yeah, I do have opinions about the live-action Gundam movie news that came out this week. And, assuming the movie actually happens, you will hear all about those opinions in, I don't know, 20 years? And I'm Nina, new to Double Zeta and cheering on the inside during some of this episode's cooler moments. Mobile Suit Breakdown is made possible by the support of 438 patrons and subscribers. Thank you all, and special thanks go out to our newest supporters. Distraction... Joamet G, and Lefty Jr. 2001 Gaming and Drawing. This podcast would not be possible without your support. And remember, dear listeners, that links to all of the different ways to support us and keep us ad-free are listed together on our website at gundampodcast.com support. Before we get started, I have a few quick updates. First, don't forget that there will be no new episode next week. That's Saturday, April 24th but we'll be back to our regular schedule after that. By the time you listen to this episode, the voting for the Haiku Contest will be over. But as of this recording, voting is still ongoing, and any poem could win. So we'll announce the grand prize winner, plus the judges' prizes, and of course, one lucky winner chosen at random in two weeks, when we get back from our break. This week we are covering Mobile Suit Gundam Double Zeta Episode 34, Camille's Voice, or... Kamiyu no Koe. This episode originally aired on October 25th, 1986. It was written by Endo Akinori and directed by Toshifumi Kawase. And as a side note, Kawase is currently the head director for the Roman Gladiators martial arts anime Cestus, the Roman Fighter, which is airing in the 2021 spring TV season. In fact, the first episode aired just this week, in case you want to see how he's developed as a director in the past 35 years. Just to be clear though, I haven't watched it and this is not a recommendation. For research this episode, I will be looking at Double Zeta's use of Dublin as a setting. How does the Gundam version map to the real place? What's been fudged and what does it all mean? But first, the crisis of infinite radio dramas continues over on Radio Free Shangri-La. And now... A new episode in... The Crisis of Infinite Radio Dramas! This week, the heroic and audacious escapades of... Me, Nathan Von Naritzberg, narrator to the stars. Morale at Radio Free Shangri-La was at an all-time low after contract negotiations between the Union and Mr. Timson reached an impasse. Tim, this says, In the event that actor leaves Radio Free Shangri-La, the company will retain the right to exploit their likeness in perpetuity. To prevent competition, actor will be barred from performing in other radio dramas, TV dramas, cinematic dramas, theatrical dramas, or real-life dramas for a period of 10 years. I think that's perfectly reasonable. Furthermore, actor will also be barred from appearing in public, appearing in private, speaking, allowing themselves to be perceived, or submitting to the mortifying ordeal of being known for a period of five years. I assure you that non-compete clause is both perfectly legal and non-negotiable. With talks stalled, 
It seemed certain that the crisis of infinite radio dramas would collapse under the weight of Tim Timpson's hubris. But behind the scenes, he was already plotting his most fiendishly brilliant move yet. Who's ready for a pizza party? Now, because our budget is stretched thin as it is, I wasn't able to purchase pizzas for all of you, but I did get you all tickets to a networking event with an unlimited pizza buffet at the Hyman Hotel and Convention Center on Axis. Little did we know, as we entered the Convention Center on that fateful night, that we would soon find ourselves enmeshed in our own crisis of infinite radio dramas. Our thoughts were elsewhere. Ugh, I really need something to rinse the taste of become a monster canned energy beverage out of my mouth. Go ahead and gorge yourselves, you amateurs. I came here to network, and I'm not leaving until I have found the most important person here and had a stilted conversation with them. Later that night. <laughs> Good evening. I'm broadcasting live from the terrace of the Presidential Palace here in Dakar, where tonight I will be joined by Neo Zeon Regent and total girl boss, Haman Karn, Herman Korn, Makan Harm, Supreme Commander of the League of Free Planets. Thank you for joining me, Madam Harm. It's a pleasure to be here, and an honor to be interviewed by such an accomplished broadcaster. You're very kind. Let's begin by addressing that noise in the background. Is it true that as we speak, this mansion is under attack by AU, Admiral Evil's armada of wickedness? That's right. We lured them here so that our forces could destroy them in a show of strength to celebrate Space Princess Miranda's cotillion. And you're so confident that you agreed to sit down for an interview during the battle? That is so inspiring. My next question is... Uh, pardon me, ma'am. There's a uh, shifty-looking guy trying to sneak into the shop behind you. I am not shifty-looking. At worst, I am heroic-looking, in a roguish sort of way. Guards, seize him. Wait, no! I just want to share my feelings! Oh, oh, oh. I've written poems! Oh. This one starts making harm, more like making hearts appear whenever I see you! It's free verse! I sincerely apologize to our viewers for that interruption. Now back to my interview with Makan Harm, with radio drama darling Tish Tishvale. In the background, you can hear the flashbulbs of the paparazzi. The people love you, Tish. Thank you. I deserve it. You certainly do. To what do you credit your astronomical success? There's simply no substitute for hard work, leaning in, knowing the right people, going to the right schools, coming from a well-connected family, and merciless suppression of dissent by whatever means necessary. In the final calculation, the people crave a strong leader. I, Makan Harm, possess that strength. I offer them peace, stability, a clear enemy to hate, and a grand narrative to believe in. And they love me for it. Wow. I know, right? I got chills. Excuse me, Lady Haman? Hmm? I believe that someone is coming. Is this someone else? Landed near the palace. Yes, it looks as if it's a bunch of actors who... What are those idiots doing? Never mind. I'll handle this. Oh, do we need to relocate? That's fine. I can keep recording as we walk. Where are we going? You presume too much for a mere newscaster. We are going nowhere. I? I'm going to take care of some business. But I thought we were going to be girl bosses together. A true girl boss does not tolerate rivals. Ouch, folks. Yeah. That has got to hurt. Thompson, where did you come from? Oh, I snuck past the guards when they were wrestling Brendan Brendanson away from the pizza buffet. And I suppose you've come to gloat over my humiliation? Oh, um, yes. Is that a knife? What? No. Yes, and it's time to end this. Don't be ridiculous. Wait, did you see that? It was like the whole world glitched for a second, and I was talking to a different version of you. It happened before, during the interview. Well, I've got nothing to say to you, Thompson. You were a good newscaster, but you lost your edge once you got to the top. 
Now, if you'll excuse me, I think I can still convince Lady Haman to accept me into her inner circle. Nina, wait. I said good day, sir. Uh, you didn't, actually. And now the recap for Camille's voice. Explosions continue to rain down on Dublin, and Fa admits she's worried about Camille. In an instant, Bright hops out of the jeep. We can walk from here, he tells her, and he and Judo jog down the road toward the Argama, leaving Fa to return to the city and make sure Camille is safe. The situation aboard the Argama is chaotic. Preparations to take off are taking longer than usual, most of the mobile suits haven't launched yet, and on the bridge, Acting Captain Torres argues with the bridge crew about whether they need to wait for Bright. In the hangar, L takes charge of assigning the remaining pilots to the remaining mobile suits. Before anyone can object, Pudu takes control of the Double Zeta. All this time, Ru and Bicha have been fighting Arias Moma's squad, but they are outnumbered and beginning to flag. Arius slices an arm from Beach's mobile suit, then knocks the mobile suit out of the sky, sending it crashing through a stone bridge and into the river below. One of Arius' wingmen lands in the river, readying a coup de grace, but is shot before he can bring down his beam saber. Reinforcements have arrived. Another Axis mobile suit is destroyed, and Arius orders a retreat. Swinging by in his base jabber to pick up a mobile suit that crash landed in the river, before returning to the Sandra to regroup. Air raid sirens continue to blare throughout the city. Fa finally reaches her lodgings, only to find Camille's bed empty, and no sign of him anywhere. But the sheets are still warm. He can't have gone far. Focused on repairing damage from the fight, the Argama crew are surprised to see a small convoy headed their way, the cars full of police and Federation officials. The convoy stops a short distance from the ship, and a man begins to address them over a megaphone. He is the mayor of Dublin, and with the backing of the Federation, he has come to confiscate the Argama. He demands they lay down arms and surrender their ship, and Bright scoffs at the order, telling the crew to ignore it and focus on repairs. But their attention is drawn back outside by the appearance of another car, driven by Fa. Police in the convoy block her from going to the Argama, and when she tries to push past, one of them pins her arms behind her back. Suddenly, Judo, El, and Eno appear, armed with guns, and threaten to shoot if the police don't let Fa go. Once she is safely at their side, the kids fire a few warning shots at the feet of the mayor, the police, and the rest of the group, driving them off. After a tearful reunion with Shintan Kum, Fa explains why she's there. She begs for their help in finding Camille. Once Bright agrees, it doesn't take long for the core fighters to launch, and a small group goes with Fa in her car. Pudu whines about being left behind, but mid-conversation, she sits up straight and stares off at nothing. Glemmy is coming. Before anyone can stop her, she runs to the hangar, gets in the still-damaged Mark II, and takes off. As she's launching, the bridge crew detect the incoming Neo Zeon ship. Torres tries to recall the mobile suits, but until he can get through to them, Pudu is on her own. She takes aim at the bridge of the Sandra, jumping off her base jabber just before it crashes, then firing over and over, enough to damage but not destroy the bridge. Arius asks for permission to use the Psycho Gundam, but Glemmy refuses. It would destroy him, and anyway, Glemmy has already chosen its pilot. Even in his regular mobile suit, Arius is a threat. Intent on the bridge, Pudu doesn't see Arius coming up behind her, but then an unfamiliar voice sounds in her head. The enemy is behind you, and she turns, narrowly evading a shot. As she fights, anytime she begins to panic or isn't sure what to do, the voice guides her. But the damaged mobile suit and Pudu's own lack of experience with it mean that before long, both are running low on energy. The voice does what Torres could not. It calls into the minds of the whole Gundam team, telling them, the girl's in danger, and telling them where to go. She is knocked onto one of the launch decks of the Sandra, right up to the Psycho Gundam. 
Crying with fear and frustration, Hudu's powers seem to activate the massive mobile armor. Its eyes light up, its thrusters activate, but the voice calls her back, warns her away before she can be caught. Arius beheads Hudu's mobile suit, leaving her to fight mostly blind. Another hit sends her crashing into the beach. Sweating and exhausted, Pudu collapses, unconscious in the cockpit, just before the Gundam team arrive. The voice reassures Judo that she is alive before urging, Focus on the enemies in front of you. Once the parts dock successfully and form the Double Zeta, Arius's squadron doesn't stand a chance. The Double Zeta's high mega cannon obliterates a mobile suit and pilot, and the glancing blow it lands on the Sandra rattles the massive ship, forcing them to retreat. The Gundam team regroup. Comparing notes, they realize it was Camille whose voice they heard. Pudu regains consciousness, and although Fa tells her to rest, she says that if Judo carries her, she can take them to Camille. They find him sitting on a rocky shore, staring out to sea, his hair and pajamas dripping from the spray. He stands and turns when Fa calls his name, but even when she hugs him tight, he stares blankly, arms limp at his sides. I had something of a breakthrough this episode with regards to how new types are portrayed in Double Zeta and how it's different from previous Gundam series. And it has to do with new type power being a set of individual abilities, but also abilities in the aggregate, <laughs> in a communal sense. We have seen individual new types go head to head, new type power to new type power. However, when Arius loses to the Gundam team, it's because of the ways their new type powers allow them to better work together. It's not just that they can communicate across these distances instantaneously. It's not just their reaction times. It's the ways in which their new type abilities like network them together <laughs> and allow them to work in this very effective way as a group, rather than just about this one individual person is so fast and so responsive because they're such a powerful new type. And I feel like the previous series have mostly been about individual new types and their powers and their abilities. And the emphasis in Double Zeta is so much more about, and the new type powers let them talk to each other. And the new type powers let Camille have this like bird's eye view of the fight and then give advice instantaneously to everyone who's, you know, in the weeds. And so even if they could have that bird's eye view, it wouldn't actually be helpful to them. It would be a distraction in the midst of combat. But from his position outside it, it's like a huge benefit. Camille's role here as operator, let's call it, of this new type crew resembles what we saw Lena and Pudu doing back in the Dakar episodes. This is a maybe a more advanced version of it now that the kids have had a little bit of practice being guided by a all-seeing, all-knowing new type. Consciousness. <laughs> yeah, that, that works. I was thinking of something like a new type positioning system. But it also resembles the way that we saw, say, Sela or Fra on the bridge of the White Base in First Gundam directing those pilots. We've seen less of that in Zeta and Double Zeta, partly because the characters who sit on the bridge are just not as important to the larger story, partly because with more pilots, there's less time to focus on, say, Torres giving orders like that. And partly probably because of the Minovsky particles and the interference, and it's just, it hasn't been a priority. As you very correctly pointed out, there's been a much greater focus on the individuals and their powers. And that word powers is actually something I want to focus on because we can talk about new type-ism, new types in terms of power, or we can talk about it in terms of relationships. We're moving away from focusing just on their powers and now to focusing more on the interactions between new types. And it just goes to show how wrong-headed Arius is when he says, oh, if I have a more powerful mobile suit or mobile armor that can better use my own abilities, then I'll be able to stand up to them. He hasn't really identified their true strength, which is the group. 
See, I think that's a realization he could never actually make, because if he did, the next logical conclusion would be that it's impossible for him to defeat them, because the way Axis works, it's simply impossible for him to create that kind of relationship, for him to form or find a group that can work that way. At a baseline DNA level, the two groups are just composed totally differently. The other thing that really appeals to me about this depiction of New Type's true power and true strength being this sort of group connectedness is that it resolves one of the issues we identified previously, which is the disconnect between experience and raw ability. So much of Camille's advice to Pudu is not just that he can see everything that's happening, it's that he has experience that she doesn't have and he gets to supplement her. She's very scarily good at killing people. We've seen that many times over. But in unusual situations, she doesn't know what to do. And it's not just Camille's experience in combat that is on display here. There's also his specific experience with, for example, the Psycho Gundam. Because when Puru gets too close to it, and she starts to commune with the computer in the Psycho Gundam, which we know from what Haman said in a previous episode and what we saw in Zeta, this is a machine that takes over the minds of new types who have a particular affinity with it. And Camille knows that just as well as we do. And when Puru starts to get close, he's able to interrupt that connection. And he's able to do with Puru what he could never do in Zeta. He is able to save someone from the Psycho Gundam. Well, because he caught her before she really started piloting it. <laughs> and because, I mean, he's different now. He's yeah, like, absolutely. He's different in so many ways, one of which is that now he's a disembodied new type consciousness. And he can do with these powers things he couldn't do when he was a soldier, a killer, piloting the Zeta Gundam. Even as the best pilot, even as the most effective soldier in Ayug, he couldn't save Four or Rosamia or Sarah. But now, elevated, with his consciousness approaching a higher plane, he can. And this is a lot like the last episode of First Gundam, when the Gundam was destroyed and Amuro was using his second sight, his clairvoyance, to guide all of the other people from the white base to safety. Hearing Camille be so with it and together and aware of everything that's going on. And calm. But then seeing him at the end of the episode, and the body is there, but the Camille is elsewhere. The contrast between those two really begs the question, is what's happened to Camille actually tragic? Or does it feel tragic to Fa and to us normal mortals because we don't understand and can't possibly understand the ways in which he's been freed from his body? How does he feel about that? We have no idea. But there is a sense that perhaps what we're viewing as this tragic and sad incapacity is not what we think it is. But it is still tragic for the people who care about him, for Fa, and as this episode goes out of its way to demonstrate, Bright and Astanaji and Torres, the whole Argama crew remembers and misses this kid and is willing to go to great lengths to try to find him again. This might be better for him, but what about everybody else? And that goes back to the individualism versus collectivism you were talking about with the new type abilities. Do we live for ourselves? Do we live for others? What is the balance between those two? I don't necessarily see his current state as related to that same argument. I see it more as lots of people pursuing lots of different ideals, good and bad, have posited that when you truly pursue your goals, when you truly pursue something great, it's often very lonely. People around you don't understand, and it may alienate them. Is Camille's current existence the next step in a positive direction, and it's sad for everyone else because they don't understand? Or is it something's gone horribly wrong? Like, the story hasn't made it completely clear yet. Well, again, think back to First Gundam and to Amuro. 
where Amuro, we saw, had a lonely existence as he transcended what it meant to be human. He lost touch with the people around him, especially with Fra. That was a major part of their character development was the growing apart. And by the end of it, the only person that Amuro could really connect with was Shar. And if the show had just ended there, we could perhaps have wondered about whether this was a good thing or a bad thing, but it doesn't end there. We see Amuro again in Zeta, and we see what that isolation has done to him. But is Camille really isolated? If he can commune with people on this mental level, is he truly isolated? Or is he only isolated because other people fail to see, fail to recognize what he is now? But if he can't commune with Fa... Do we know that he can't? It seems like he can't. I, there's no indication that he can. And then that bit at the end where, they're, uh, where they find him again and she's embracing him, but his arms are just at his side, like he doesn't recognize her, m gives me the impression that those two are not connecting. I mean, obviously, the fact that we've only seen him do this during a fight, not a great sign. I'm not saying that everything with Camille is totally fine and dandy and we have nothing to worry about. I'm only saying that this episode complicates the narrative. We have been thinking of it as, oh, ever since that last fight with Sirocco, Camille has been horribly psychically wounded. And this says, maybe Camille's current state isn't entirely bad. And I think that's uncomfortable for us to think about. Well, as I said, either at the end of Zeta or early on in this season, what happens to Camille is tragic, but also maybe the best thing that could have happened to him. He is freed from the pain and the suffering and the necessity of violence. And we now see that he is, if slowly, healing. He can walk around on his own. He can go down to the seashore even if he's not completely aware of what he's doing, and that his consciousness has, in some form, survived. So, yeah, I think, I think this does complicate that narrative. I think it does suggest that there is a future for him, that there is a moving forward. And by bringing Fa and Camille back into the story, and with the, uh, the visual reference to Rosamia in the previous episode, we do get a sense of moving on generally within this world, of how stories don't stop at the most climactic or the most tragic moment. Bad things happen, but the world keeps moving on, and there's always the possibility of healing, of growth, of creating good new things in the ruins of other good things that have been destroyed. It only occurred to me while we were talking about it, but I think there's something too. Most people don't understand true greatness. Like, they won't understand what you're trying to do, and like... How many of Jesus' disciples before he let himself be captured and put to death understood why? I don't necessarily think they're doing a Jesus thing with Camille, but this idea that the pursuit of something truly revolutionary is alienating to most people around you. Absolutely. Although that is also so dangerous. Well, it can be good and or bad, right? Like <laughs> exactly. And it's dangerous because if you start going down that path and the people around you can't understand what you're doing or why you're doing it and they keep telling you to stop, maybe you should listen to them or maybe not. Right. <laughs> you're sort of saying that when you commit to that individual course of, let's say, greatness, you're moving beyond guidance or advice. No one can tell you if you're doing the right thing or the wrong thing. And I think in general, the sorts of people in Gundam who walk down that path do so for the wrong reasons and with catastrophically destructive results. When you have a leader, for instance, who is walking that path of greatness, so to speak, they become kind of indispensable in that role. And I think the major theme of this episode is actually indispensability and replaceability. In addition to being the major theme of this episode, I think that is developing into one of Double Zeta's major themes as a whole. This gets set up for us at the very beginning of the episode when Bright and Judo are racing back to the Argama while Arius' team is attacking Dublin. And Judo says the Argama can't move without its captain. 
But in the very next scene, of course, we see that it can, uh, because Torres is sitting in the captain's chair and he orders the argument to take off. And I cannot believe he is the most senior officer left aboard that ship. <laughs> poor Torres. Doubly poor Torres, because he has to deal with exactly the same sass from the bridge crew that Bright always has to. And then we see Puru in the double Zeta. And what does she say? She says, I need to do my best in Judo's place. Yeah, I'm subbing for Judo, basically. Yeah, yeah. And so on the Argama, everyone is replaceable in their roles. Somebody else can sit in the captain's chair and give the orders. It doesn't have to be bright. We've seen any number of people pilot different mobile suits under whatever conditions that's necessary. Yeah, in this episode, Beecha is in the Mark II, presumably because it was the one that was fueled up and ready to go, even though he usually pilots the Hyakushiki. And L had intended to pilot the Double Zeta, but once Puru is in the Double Zeta, she says, okay, I'll take the Hyakushiki. They, in their specific roles as pilot or captain or whatever, can be replaced. L has kind of replaced Fa as like, ship mom, although in her case, it's more like ship big sister. This replaceability comes up again when Puru is wearing the dress that Judo bought for Lena. Since she was introduced, we've seen again and again with Puru this question of whether or not she can or should replace Lena in the functioning of the crew, in this group of friends, in Judo's heart as his surrogate little sister. And that question has only become more important, more immediate, since Lena's death. After all, Puru herself offered to replace Lena. But Puru also comes to understand that while Judo cares about her and will look after her, he's still sad about Lena, and he's going to continue to be sad about Lena. She shows up in the dress because they find it in storage. And she sees immediately how sad it makes Judo, even though he tries to put a nice spin on it of like, well, it's better for Puru to wear it than for it to sit in storage, unused, forever. But she changes out of it right away, because she sees how sad it makes him. The problem with her stepping into Lena's role, if we want to call it that, is that in doing so, she reminds Judo of Lena and makes him sad. And I think she's starting to understand that connection. She wants to have a relationship with him on her own terms, not just as a substitute for the sister he lost. And this is helping her to grow past the resentment she felt towards Lena back when Lena was Glemmy's favored little protege and Puru was being put through horrible cyber new type training. Puru wanted to be Lena, but now she's starting to understand and grow into a new role, into her own role. While everyone is replaceable in their roles, they are still indispensable in our hearts and in their hearts. When everybody on the Argama learns that Camille is missing and they all decide to go looking for him, you can see that even after all this time, they remember this kid. They like this kid. They miss him. They want to take care of him, even though he's not useful to them anymore, even though his replacement, Judo, is literally right there. And perhaps the most poignant example of this is when Fa comes back. And the orphans, Shinta and Kum and Haro, are all like, Fa, we missed you so much. Why did you leave us? And they're all like clinging to her. And even in the next scene, they're still <laughs> clinging to her. I love that. They won't let her go. They've all got huge smiles on their face. Even Haro seems to be smiling. Everyone is so genki to see her again. But over on the Sandra, this is reversed. And this is the core emotional difference between the two sides, between our heroes and the villains. Whatever negative things we have to say about Ayug and Bright and the organization, here is the crux of the distinction. On the Sandra, in Axis, people are indispensable in their roles and replaceable as people. When Puru goes to take out Glemmy, it's because she knows, and I think she's correct about this, that if she killed Glemmy, the whole Axis operation here in Dublin would collapse because it's all reliant on Glemmy as the leader and his personal plans and ambitions. But Glemmy literally has a replacement Puru that he calls Puru to. And when Puru left, he was no more than mildly affected by her betrayal. 
and when Lena died, he was briefly inconvenienced. Arius is an interesting piece of this, because Arius is literally a replacement for August, in that Glemmy needed a mobile suit team and Arius was dispatched by Haman to replace August as Glemmy's mobile suit team commander. He's also pretty much a replacement for August because he brings that same feeling of resentment that he, as an experienced adult man soldier, is being replaced and surpassed by all these teenage new types. And in keeping with your theory, when he proposes occupying a different role, Glummy says, no, no, I have you here to fulfill this specific role and I need you to fill it. I have someone else for that. Glemmy's whole thing is that he decides who you are. If you're in his employ, he decides what your role will be. He molds people into fit the roles that he has decided are best for them. And in a funny way, Bright has resigned any responsibility for doing that, with the younger members of the crew at any rate. I particularly liked the conversation he has on the bridge with the Gundam team, where he says, well, now we know what Pudu is capable of, we know what an asset she can be. And the way everybody reacts to this realization is different. Bright sees risk to the rest of the crew. The idea that Pudu is maybe some kind of sleeper agent and could turn on them unexpectedly at any moment. Right, because Bright has done this before. Bright has seen this before. This is exactly what happened with Rosamia. Judo sees risk to Pudu. Like, you're going to put Pudu in active combat? Rue sees a breaking of norms. She sees this very young girl and you're going to make her an official pilot? Uh, that's such a good observation. I hadn't put that together that that was Rue's issue was the, the normative question, but it totally is. Yeah. And Rue really likes those rules. She sure does. And Bright hedges. He says he's not going to make Pudu an official pilot, but it's clear that they're not going to make any effort to stop Pudu from piloting if and when she decides to do it on her own. Look, Bright has done this before. He knows he can't keep teens out of mobile suits. He's been trying for years to keep teens out of mobile suits, and it never works. So just accept it. But it also removes any responsibility on his part, right? He's not the monster who made a 10-year-old a pilot. Well, we took in this war orphan, and she just kept getting into mobile suits. There was nothing we could do. I mean, it's starting to look like the Argama's crew is like five people. When was the last time we saw an engineer other than Astanaji? Ponytail. Yeah, Anytail that's true. Makes a Anna, brief Hannah, appearance. Anna Hannah was in this episode, although we haven't seen her for like months. Yeah. What they definitely do not have are enough staff to like guard Pudu. I don't often compliment Endo's writing, but I thought this episode was really good. And that one of the things it did best was having these fairly brief, often rather subtle moments that emphasize the emotional connection between the characters for us. We talked about Lena's old clothes, the poignancy of Shintan Kum's reunion with Fa, the sense that Astonaji still cares about Camille and is worried about Camille. Starting from the beginning of the episode when they're in the car with Fa, and Fa is looking at the bombing and realizes suddenly she's very worried about Camille since he's still in the city. And Bright immediately says, okay, we'll get out here. We'll walk the rest of the way. Go check on Camille. Bright feels guilty. Bright feels like he owes Camille, and, you know, this is a very brief moment. All he's doing is getting out of the car, but I felt it really conveyed that sense that Bright still feels like he owes Camille something. I agree completely. Judo puts that picture of Fa and Camille in his cockpit, and he thinks to himself, Hey Camille, I would really like to talk to you. Like, I have some questions I wish I could ask you. Because honestly, who does he have for mentorship? Who does Judo have who's a little ahead of him in this and can give him any kind of relevant advice? <laughs> Basically Literally nobody. no one. <laughs> you identified that Pudu goes to take out Glemmy. She also apologizes to Glemmy before she does it. Yeah. She feels she needs to kill him. But she also knows that he took care of her for years and... And those feelings haven't just gone away. She resents him, but she also cares about him still. And one of the final ones, and for me most poignant moments, is after the fight, almost at the end of the episode, when they've gotten Pudu out of her cockpit and they're checking on her and Fa goes into nurse mode. She's like, don't move her, don't try to talk, don't tire yourself out. 
Hooter says, I know where Camille is. And there's this moment of hesitation in Fa, like a hitch in her breath. And she says, don't worry about that now. You can show us when you're better. And my heart just like overflowed. Fa is the most <laughs> selfless person. Yeah. Her whole life is about taking care of and protecting and trying to help Camille. But she's not going to let this 10-year-old hurt herself to do it. Fa's greatest conflicts have always been when she's torn between two different sets of responsibilities, two different groups of people to take care of. Back in like episode 10 or 11, when the Argama had left Shangri-La and left Camille behind, Fa was torn up inside between her responsibilities to the Argama and her desire to be looking after Camille. And this is the same thing again. And when she came to Dublin and she brought Camille here to recuperate and get treatment, we know that she went to the hospital and she begged them to give her a job. They say that in the prior episode. There's a couple of ways you could read that. You could say Fa needed the money, and so she begged for a job, even though she wasn't really qualified for it. And I, I think that's a reasonable but incorrect reading. I think it's more likely that she begged for the job because she wanted something to do. She wanted to be able to help, because that's what Fa does. She helps. And they make the distinction in the previous episode, because we see her working as like an orderly or a cleaner in the hospital itself, right? She's collecting linens, she's dropping off supplies and things. But then when the ambulance arrives at Beach Mansion, the nurse apologizes for Fa getting roped into it, and Fa says, I begged for this job. So they don't normally bring people in Fa's position out on these ambulance calls. But Fa is not afraid of danger. <laughs> she's not put off by the battlefield. There's no hesitancy for her there, and it's also a place where she feels like she can be of most use. You didn't mention the bit where Judo and Elle are talking about Fa, and Judo oh. says she looks thinner, doesn't she? And Elle's like, yeah. Right, the implication being that she's so worried or working so hard that she's not eating enough. Another possible interpretation of that line, which I mentioned for the sake of completeness, not because I subscribe to this, but it could, when contrasted with the lavish meal of the prior episode, be meant to show that the common people in Dublin are struggling to get enough to eat, while the Federation leadership is feasting just a few miles away. I think that's a plausible reading, but within the bounds of this episode, there's no additional support for that. I think it's much more likely that it's about Fa's emotions specifically, which is what this episode is much more focused on especially in the context of the scene in which they say the line, because it's Fa saying, I know I'm not a part of the Argama anymore, and I don't really have any right to ask you to help me, but would you please help me find Camille? And there are tears in her eyes. And then they have the line about how she's gotten skinny. It makes much more sense in this episode as a line about her mental state over the period of time in which she hasn't been part of the show. I already mentioned I thought this was a great episode. In addition to the way some of these very emotional moments were written, I also really liked the way it was, I'm going to say, storyboarded. <laughs> what I think of is sort of the choreography, the acting of the episode itself, the way the characters move, things that they do. Torres's body language when he's acting captain and he's hunched in the chair and his shoulders are up around his ears. And he looks so uncomfortable. The dust and wind and hair movement for Judo and Bright as they're approaching the Argama, which is in the process of taking off. Arius picking up his wingman and his wingman just sort of like grabs hold of the base jabber as they fly off. And they're having trouble getting enough lift so that they have to fly along skimming the waters of the River Liffey. And then, in a later part of that scene, Arius's other wingman appears in the background and then is shot down. All of this happening in the background while these other two mobile suits are flying through the foreground. Pudu using the mobile suits like feet jets to fend off Arius when they're fighting on the Sandra. And a couple of times, Arius's team uses the base jabber to slam the Mark II. Yeah, just really enjoyed the fight choreography, even things like 
the way characters stand and move, the confrontation between the Federation officers or Federation police and the kids from the Argama who are there to get Fa. Everything felt visually interesting. Everything felt emotionally relevant and appropriate. It did feel like a bit of a step down from the prior two episodes, just in terms of the quality of the drawing, the quality of the animation, but it was still very good. I did wonder, since I just mentioned it, the Federation can't possibly have thought that their demand that the Argama crew step down and surrender their ship was going to work. So is the point just to make the Argama outlaws? Well, maybe they thought it would work. I mean, Bright is more or less a Federation officer, and, and in the last episode he had his collar buttoned up and he went to Beach Mansion to try to appeal to those Federation leaders as a Federation captain. That was before they left him in a basement to die. Well, yes. And I think it's actually more interesting that Bright refuses outright these Federation demands and basically says, what can they do about it? Because prior to his encounter at Beach Mansion, I don't know, Bright might have actually listened to them if a bunch of Federation officers had shown up and said, hey, stand down. He might have at least considered it. He might have been tormented. Whereas in this case, he's just like, whatever. I think the Federation officer who is with the mayor of Dublin in that scene is probably the same one who was in charge of security at Beach Mansion. He looks pretty similar. Although I noticed he has that kind of like sallow, yellowish mm. skin tone thing yep. that uh, Corpse Captain had in <laughs> Zeta Gundam. And if we hadn't watched Corpse Captain get atomized, I might think that he was pulling a Quattro Bagina right now. He does look strikingly similar. If you didn't listen to season two, Corpse Captain was Captain Gotti Kinsey of the Titans. Yeah, his skin tone was always kind of sallow, sometimes verging on greenish. He did not look well. In general, we try not to get too hung up on little continuity errors, but there are some pretty funny ones but, in this episode. Yeah, there's some big ones in this episode. The biggest one, I think, is that in that initial combat, when the Mark II gets its arm chopped off by Arius and then crashes into a bridge, and in the very next scene, the bridge is intact and so is the arm. Yeah, the, the reappearing bridge is pretty wild. Well, and then the arm is gone again once they're back on the Argama. The other one that I thought was funny was Bright's disappearing undershirt. In one scene, he's got his uniform open and you can see a white undershirt there. In another scene, uniform still open, but no undershirt. Maybe it's just like a super deep V-neck undershirt, <laughs> like going all the way down to the navel. There's a different continuity error that I want to highlight for a second, which is, is Arius Moma a new type or not? In the prior episode, he gets the new type Flash. In this episode, they talk about him very clearly as though he is not a new type. Disagree. I think there's a general understanding that even among new types, it takes very specific training to be able to operate the Saikomu. That but, not just any new type can do it. But don't they call him an ordinary person? Like an ordinary human? I don't remember that, but it sounds like they could have done. I mean, probably we're just seeing another disconnect between two different writing teams. However, I still think it fits within the story. The new types who have used the Saikomu in the past are generally either extremely powerful or specially trained. I wondered if it was an artifact of that distinction between new types, who we call new types, and cyber new types, who in the Japanese are called enhanced humans, Kyoka Ningen. So he's not a Kyoka Ningen, he's a normal Ningen. He's a normal new type, but only enhanced humans can use the Psycho Gundam. Maybe. Did not know what to make of the mayor's line about... This land has an independent spirit that outsiders wouldn't understand. What does that have to do with anything? That's why I'm taking orders from the Federation. Yeah, there is that problem. Of course, that line calls to mind Ireland's long history of resistance to British imperial domination, but it also connects Ireland to the other communities that we've seen them visit so far in Double Zeta, from Moon Moon to Gardaia to El Golea. 
All of these places are independent communities that exist in tension with outsiders in the form of the Gundam team, Axis or Neo Zeon, and even the Federation as a whole. And now Tom's research on Dublin and Beach Mansion. This week I want to talk a bit about Dublin and follow up on a comment I made in the last podcast about the naming of Beach Mansion. I want to talk about how Dublin is depicted visually and described in the script of the episode and how that tracks against the real world city and its environs. But I'm not going to talk too much about the city's history or the role that it played as the backdrop to much of Ireland's long struggle for independence from English and British domination. I will touch on that a little bit, but I'm going to try to focus on the geography. But something tells me that we'll be coming back to Ireland, Dublin, and their history before too long. Dublin is the capital of Ireland, and with a population just over 1 million in urban Dublin, and nearly 2 million if you include the greater Dublin area, it's also the most populous city on the island. It is an ancient city, with medieval roots that go back at least a thousand years, but probably much farther. The River Liffey runs through the city, and Dublin's harbour is a natural bay formed where the river joins the Irish Sea, sheltered by the hilly peninsula of Hoth Head to the north. Located on the eastern coast of Ireland, Dublin is about 90 miles south of Belfast, where the White Base stopped in First Gundam. It's just 70 miles due west from Anglesey in Wales, and about 130 miles west of Liverpool in England. This combination of geographic features and location made it a particularly convenient place for groups coming to Ireland by ship to land, which is probably why the oldest settlements in the area for which we have solid evidence were built by Norse settlers, who had an antagonistic relationship with the local Irish, to say the least. Later, in the 12th century, it was seized by and became the center of power in Ireland for the Anglo-Norman Plantagenet dynasty of England, who had an antagonistic relationship with the local Irish, to say the least. From the 17th until the 20th centuries, it was the center of economic and political life for the Protestant ascendancy, a tiny minority of wealthy Protestant landowners and intelligentsia, mostly Englishmen and later their descendants, who dominated Ireland and had, say it with me now, an antagonistic relationship with the local Irish, to say the least. I know I said at the outset that I wasn't going to talk too much about the history, but history and place are so tightly entwined that I really can't talk about one without the other. And it's important for you to know all of what I just said, because in these past two episodes of Double Zeta, we have seen proud civic buildings built in a neoclassical Greek revival style with porticos and cupolas, and those are legacies of the 18th and 19th centuries, monuments to the power and wealth of the empire during the Georgian era. And Beach Mansion? The outskirts of Dublin are dotted with grand old houses on sprawling estates just like it. These, too, are the legacies of the wealth concentrated in the hands of the elites who made up the Protestant ascendancy. Let's now get specific and look at the beginning of this week's episode. And by the beginning, I mean the very first shot of the episode, in which we see one of those big civic buildings. It's two stories with portico and cupola. I'm sorry, those are just fun words to say, and I don't get to say them very often. Cupola. Cupola. Why isn't there a mobile suit named Cupola? Anyway, this building faces directly onto the River Liffey, and on the left side of the screen there's a prominent statue of a man in the middle of a wide street. There's also a flat bridge across the river with a balustrade railing, and wide enough to have some kind of median. A cut later, we see the statue closer up, revealing it to be a multi-tiered column with seated figures at the bottom, and on top of the plinth there's a man in a long coat or a cape, with one hand at his side and one hand raised. Nearby, there's one of those famous red double-decker buses. As often happens in Gundam, in this latter cut we see that corner building with portico and cupola again, but it looks a fair bit different. It's square now instead of a long rectangle, it looks commercial instead of governmental, and it's three stories instead of two. It's also actually not quite square. The corner facing the bridge has been cut back to create a fifth wall not much wider than the window that's on it. 
Presumably two different background artists were responsible for these two different cuts, but it does still have that cupola, so whatever instructions or references they were given must have included that part. The statue is the easiest part to identify, because it's a very nearly perfect match in design and location for the Daniel O'Connell statue, which stands in the middle of the wide O'Connell Street and overlooks O'Connell Bridge, a wide, flat bridge with a balustrade railing and a median. Like its Gundam verse equivalent, the real O'Connell Monument is a multi-tiered column with seated figures, four visions of winged victory cast in bronze on the lower level, the people of Ireland represented on the middle tier, and then O'Connell himself stands atop the granite plinth, wearing a long cape and raising one hand pointing toward Parliament. O'Connell was a lawyer, politician, Irish independence activist, and abolitionist who is remembered as the Liberator, or the Catholic Emancipator, for his successful campaign in the early 1800s to dismantle some of the legal framework that had, for centuries, oppressed the Catholic population of the United Kingdom. As an example, under the Act of Supremacy, anyone holding a public office, serving in Parliament, or even studying at university was required to swear an oath acknowledging the monarch of England as head of the church. That was easy if you were Anglican, but it effectively barred Catholics from government and higher education. When the Catholic O'Connell won election to Parliament in 1828, he touched off a political crisis that ultimately saw the creation of the Catholic Relief Act in 1829, permitting Catholics to sit in Parliament. Of course, this was a very giving with one hand and taking with the other kind of relief because the act also sharply increased the minimum amount of property that a person needed to own or rent in order to be allowed to vote. I digress again, but you have to have been wondering what a person needs to do to get a statue like that, right? The statue was finished in 1882, designed by Dubliner John Henry Foley, and finished posthumously by his assistant. But one of the most poignant aspects of the monument as it stands today was never included on any of the original plans, because the monument is riddled with bullet holes from the 1916 Easter Rising, six days of fighting in which Irish Republicans attempted to overthrow the domination of the British Empire before they were suppressed by the British Army. Much of O'Connell Street, including many of the buildings that feature so prominently in this part of the episode, were flattened by British artillery, but the statue survived. If we know what the statue is and where it is, then we should be able to identify the building next to it pretty easily, right? Well, yes and no. The building next to the statue, the one that looks differently in different cuts, is probably based on at least two different buildings. As it appears in the second cut, it is a close enough to be plausible match for the building that stands in that place now, having been rebuilt after being demolished by artillery fire in 1916. Like the one in the show, the real world building has that narrow wall facing into the intersection with the bridge, and it's got a similar looking cupola. Today, it is mostly occupied by a large branch of Ulster Bank. But this same building's first appearance is much more interesting to me. In this appearance, it is a rectangle with one long side facing the river, two stories, and a huge portico supported by eight massive stone columns in the center, and of course, still that large cupola. There's no building like that right in the spot next to the O'Connell Monument, or even on that intersection, but there are a couple of candidates in the vicinity. Head up O'Connell Street two blocks and you will find the general post office, which is roughly the right shape, and it has a huge portico supported by six massive columns. It's among Dublin's most famous buildings. It served as the headquarters for the leaders of the Easter Rising. It was gutted by fire during that battle, and it was subsequently left in ruins for more than a decade before being rebuilt. It is a solid contender, but you know what it hasn't got? A cupola. And it's also not overlooking the water. Let's go hunting for a better match. Go back to the O'Connell Monument, and this time, follow the River Liffey eastward, downstream, and after passing a few bridges, you will reach the Custom House, which is pretty close to the right shape, it's roughly the right height, it overlooks the river in exactly the right way, and it has a cupola. Although it has only got four columns in its portico, and I think we can all agree that that is not enough columns. The Custom House survived the 1916 Easter Rising intact, but five years later, during the Irish War of Independence, 
It, too, was gutted by fire when Irish Republican Army volunteers seized and then burned the building. Championing the operation after the fact, the propaganda wing of the Irish Republic called the Custom House, quote, the seat of alien tyranny. Like I said, you can't really talk about the place without touching the history. And I don't think any of this is a coincidence. This pair of episodes includes Bright referring to Dublin's past as a city that was once part of Britain, and the mayor of Dublin declares that Ireland is a land with an independent spirit incomprehensible to outsiders. The very first shots of the episode linger on a monument to an Irish independence leader, the street named for him, the bridge named for him, an intersection that saw tremendous fighting during the long struggle for independence. The building seems certain to have been based on either the post office or the custom house, both Georgian era monuments to the power of the British Empire over Ireland, both of which were burned during the struggle to overthrow that power, and then rebuilt in its aftermath by the nascent Irish nation. And it's funny that Glemmy, despite having, you know, a flying battleship, still approaches Dublin via the water, entering the harbor, just like the Norse or the Normans or the English before him. So that was 1,700 words or so, about two cuts of animation that account for a grand total of 12 seconds at the start of one episode. Let's pivot to the focal point of the prior episode, An Afternoon in Dublin, and talk about Beach Mansion. Long-time listeners will not be surprised to hear that I wanted to see if I could find some real-world mansion in Dublin that was used as a model for the mansion where the Federation leadership hides out and where Bright goes to get smothered in smoke and shed tears. So I started looking at grand old houses around Dublin to see if any matched what we saw in the show. Now there are a ton of grand old houses around Dublin, but the show did give us a few additional hints that helped to narrow the search a little bit. First, Beach Mansion stands alone in the middle of a vast, lightly forested estate. There is a large hill overlooking it. We see this at a couple moments, in particular when the kids are driving into town and they look down at the mansion from a hillside vantage, and the hill gets mentioned repeatedly in dialogue. They say things like, the Argama is just over this hill. We'll come back to that, so just remember, there is a big hill nearby. The mansion, we know, is outside the city, separated from it by some woods and sparsely populated farmland. And finally, the Argama's landing site and the mansion itself are both north of the city. This fact is confirmed for us by a shot that shows the city, with its harbor on the left side of the screen, and mountains prominent behind it, and then tilts down to show us woods, a hill, and behind it, the Argama. With the harbor on the left and the city on the right, this shot can only have been taken from north of the city, looking south at it. The kids then see Beach Mansion from the hilltop before reaching the city center, so it must be near the Argama and likewise north of the city. That narrows the search considerably, but it also complicates it. There are farms, grand old houses, estates, and large parks, like St. Anne's Park, north of Dublin Harbor, but there aren't really the kind of large hills that we see so prominently in the episode. Dublin is bordered on the south by mountains and their foothills, but the north is relatively flat. You could say at this point that perhaps the people responsible for these episodes simply didn't know or didn't care enough about the topography around Dublin to get it right. But so much of the rest of the depiction of Dublin in these episodes fits the real city, and showing the Argama's hiding spot north of the harbor was too specific and too deliberate a choice to be simply waved away as carelessness. And you know, there is one hilly area north of Dublin that is large enough and sparsely inhabited enough to fit the depiction in the show, the Hill of Hoth on the Hoth Head Peninsula. It's about four miles too far to the east to be exactly right, but I'm prepared to forgive a little bit of futzing on the exact location, so long as it fits our other criteria. Besides historic castles and other ruins, there are a few villages on Hoth Head, but most of the land is a protected environmental reserve, which is almost certainly where the Argama set down. So if we know where they must be, does that help us identify the source of Beach Mansion? Unfortunately, no. No amount of searching turned up a house in that area or on the route from Hoth to Dublin proper that matched the one in the show. So, stymied in that pursuit, I turned to the name, 
As I mentioned in the talk back last week, they keep saying the name of the place, Beach Mansion. And that's beach like the type of tree, not beach like where the water meets the land. So I looked for places that might be called Beach Mansion or Beach House, Beach Castle, and so on. And just for the heck of it, I also looked for things like Sycamore House and Oak Chalet while I was at it. But no joy. Curiously, while we're on the subject, beech trees are native to England and Wales, but not Ireland. The beeches from which Beach Mansion takes its name are an invasive species, having been introduced in the 18th century by English planters. And like most invasive species, where they flourish, they threaten to choke out the native woodland flora. It is possible that the name Beach Mansion was chosen for this reason, as one part of a densely layered metaphor that runs all the way through these episodes about how colonial oppression, genocide, and the human capacity for willful or careless destruction of the environment are all inextricably linked. Having struck out on the name in English, I turned to the Japanese. Since we were talking about a mansion in Ireland, I had actually been surprised that the mansion's name, as said in the show, didn't include Beachy, a Japanese pronunciation of the English word beach, but rather Buna, the Japanese word for the same tree. The mansion part is Yashiki, which means mansion, state, grounds, nothing really surprising there. But when I started looking into the full Buna Yashiki name, I discovered an interesting thing. Buna Yashiki is the Japanese name for one of Sherlock Holmes's adventures, known in English by its original title, The Adventure of the Copper Beaches, or sometimes simply The Copper Beaches. And this is not an obscure reference, either. This is one of those, every result when you search online for Buna Yashiki is about the Sherlock Holmes story kind of references. I had to go seven pages deep on search results before I found a single one that wasn't about Sherlock Holmes. The Copper Beaches, or The Adventure of the Copper Beaches, is the 12th of the 56 Holmes short stories, published originally in the Strand magazine in 1892 and collected in The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes that same year. Translations of Arthur Conan Doyle's Holmes mysteries started appearing in Japan as early as 1894, and The Copper Beaches slash Buna Yashiki was first translated in 1899. Holmes became hugely popular in Japan, and according to the Japan Sherlock Holmes Club, which was founded in 1977 and erected a statue of the detective in 1988, some 95 translations and 34 adaptations were made between 1907 and 1997. Oh, and because that summing up of adaptations was done around 1999, it doesn't include perhaps the best one, which was the NHK-produced puppet Sherlock Holmes of 2014. The Holmes Club further asserts that, at least as of 1999, Holmes was the best-known English person among Japanese people, beating out the Beatles and Princess Di, who were number two and three in whatever poll they're referring to. Beyond the general popularity of the detective and his adventures, in 1984, Granada Television in the UK started producing TV adaptations of Holmes' adventures, starring Jeremy Brett as Holmes and David Burke and then Edward Hardwick as Watson. The series ran until 1994, produced 41 episodes in all, and is highly regarded. It also aired in Japan on the national broadcasting network NHK, dubbed, and almost contemporaneous with its English release. It was popular in Japan, too. I was able to find tons of information about it on Japanese fan pages, and even today, the Blu-ray release of the Granada TV version, and this is a Blu-ray release that's like 10 years old at this point, it's still the third best-selling British TV drama on Amazon Japan. The episode of the Granada Holmes that covered the Copper Beaches aired in the UK on August 25th, 1985. It was the eighth episode in the series. I couldn't find the precise date when it aired in Japan, but NHK started airing episodes in 1985, and they seem to have been at most a few months to a year behind the original air dates. Afternoon in Dublin aired on October 18th, 1986, which means that in all probability, the Buna Yashiki episode of the Granada Holmes series was on TV in Japan sometime around when the Buna Yashiki episode of Gundam Double Zeta was being written. So is that it? Just a sort of name drop reference to a beloved mystery story that just happened to be on a popular TV show that year? Is that as far as it goes? Well, no, dear listener, of course not, and frankly, I'm surprised that you'd even ask that after all this time together. 
you ought to know better, and I'm a bit disappointed. The adventure of the Copper Beaches starts with a young woman being offered way too much money to take a job as a governess at an old mansion out on a country estate. Not in Dublin, mind you, but in Hampshire, England. I'm trying not to spoil too much of the mystery, so I'm just going to say that over the course of the story it is revealed that this young woman is merely a pawn in a plot by a horrible old man to steal the inheritance that rightfully belongs to a teenage girl. And that is almost excruciatingly on theme for this show and in particular for the Afternoon in Dublin episode. Because it is the exact same thing that those horrible old men in the Federation are doing living it up at Beach Mansion, and mortgaging the future for another year of comfort, while kids like Judo watch the world they were supposed to grow up in burn down around them. Next time on episode 3.33, Hero of the One Year War, we cover Mobile Suit Gundam Double Zeta, episode 35, and... Hey, that's a good pun! Hasn't he been through enough? Terrorism. Tragedies large and small. Malthusianism. Rats are good, actually. Fake news. War crimes. And we're all mad here. You will see the battlefield of new types. Mobile Suit Breakdown is written, recorded, and produced by us, Tom and Nina, in scenic New York City, within the ancestral and unceded land of the Lenape people, and made possible by listeners like you. The opening track is Wasp by Misha Dioxin. The closing music is Long Way Home by Spinning Ratio. The recap music is New York City Instrumental by Spinning Merkaba. Radio Free Shangri-La is performed by the MSB Players. You can find links to the sources for our research, the music used in the episode, additional information about the Lenape people, and more in the show notes and on our website, GundamPodcast.com. You can get in touch with us on Twitter or Instagram, at GundamPodcast, on Facebook, at Facebook.com slash GundamPodcast, or by email, at GundamPodcast at gmail.com. Or, why not share your wrong Gundam opinions with the world by shouting, the upcoming live-action Gundam movie should be a single 90-minute shot of a person watching First Gundam on their TV. And then at the end, they turn to the camera and say, That was pretty good, huh? Out your window at passersby. We won't hear you, but the world needs to know. And thank you for listening. I have water and stomach pain. And I guess I'm ready to go. I was rambling a little bit, sorry. And seeing and hearing, very distinctly not seeing. I disagree with you a little bit there. Very nicely put. Thank you. It took me kind of a while to get there. And, and you, I just, like... Nina, an extremely harsh grader. I just get used to stuff really fast. Oh, new types are old hat, now we're three series in. <laughs> I did, deep in my heart, let out a little cheer when Camille contacts Pudu. I didn't actually cheer out loud, but the internal feeling was... Yes! <laughs> this is so cool and great! Pause. I'm gonna change the subject if that's okay. Yeah. Rue likes the rules. Buttoning up is Scott. Buttoning. Buttoning. Is Arius Momo a new type or not? Mama. Is Arius Momo? Is Arius Mumu? Will. I don't know. <laughs> I've got an antagonistic relationship with the local train, to say the least. <laughs>
It's a local train and also a local train. Hey, that's a good pun. Now I want a Japanese version of Miss Marple. An Obasan running around would, solving that mysteries. Kind of, that would be amazing. And next week on Radio Free Shangri-La. Stop following me. We are going in the same direction. The western stairwell just happens to be the closest one to the terrace. Is that Haman? Why is she shooting at those children? Doesn't she have people for that? Hey, that boy has a demon coming out of him. Uh, excuse me, son. You have a demon coming out of you. None of my subjects have manifested visible demons yet. Son, how much become a monster are you drinking? Teens love become a monster. I wasn't expecting that actually, and I'm a little concerned. Become a monster, canned energy beverage. Teens love it. All that and more awaits you on the crisis of infinite radio drama. The collision of radio realities. <laughs>